Proverbs 4, chapter 23. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The chosen church can be released. See you later, alligator. Proverbs chapter 4, um, this one verse, verses 23. <clears throat> Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Lord, I thank you for your word here this morning. Now penetrate our hearts, Lord. Teach us what this means this morning to protect our hearts. Reveal to us, Lord. And Lord, may we not only be hearers of your word, but doers also. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you weren't here last week, I did begin to talk about um, a particular book I had picked up uh, called The Divine Mentor by a guy by the name of William Cordero. Um, and if, if you've never heard, if you never read it, I would absolutely recommend you pick the book up. Um, when I picked that book up, when I finished reading it, I went back to page one and I started back all over again. And that's, but that's the kind of work that it began to do inside my own life. And it began to teach me, me a, 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 a discipline um, inside my own life to be disciplined before God. And not to be so-called my own man. Because it, it, we can so easily get caught inside of that trap, can't we, church? Sure we can. Sure we can. We could just feel good about ourselves, and God blesses us in certain things, and all of a sudden, you know, we kind of table them, and suddenly we can find ourselves in a desert somewhere looking for some bread. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So last week, um, I began to talk on uh, the divine mentor, and the scripture was, he who walks with the wise will be wise. Um, you know, our daily time with our Lord allows us, as uh, Cordero begins to talk about, to begin to hear the stories of those in days past, those who have walked with God. Uh, but God had, you know, had them do one particular thing. He had them write those things down. So those things that they did, those things they walked through with God, all the, all the things that they went through wasn't just for them, but it was for those that were going to be in the future. So in other words, write these things down. For what? For a good reason. So, so we now, in turn, in the future, the future church, as God had promised Abraham, we know, as th there would be as many descendants as the sand of the seashore, the stars of the sky, that's us. From his faith, that's where we're coming from. Because he began that walk, that personal walk uh, with God. And so we're part of that promises. And so as the years went by, God put together what we call today what his, his, Bible, his word, the Bible. And now we can look back at all these stories and these people that went through these events can begin to now as we read them, as we spend time with them, as scripture says, you hang out with the wise, you're going to be wise. So as we begin to read these stories, we begin to... They begin to mentor us also. And God's word speaks to us as we go through certain situations, certain, certain trials inside of our life. It's like, aha, oh, that's how Joseph handled that. Oh, aha, that's how David handled that. Oh, okay, that's how Solomon handled that. Oh, well, that's how, that's how Samson handled that. Oh, well, that's how Paul handled that. 
So we have no excuse now. Because now, now as we begin to spend time with God, we get, we get to be mentored by these people that have, that have walked with God, and God had them write these things down. Why? So they can begin to mentor us. They begin to teach us these things. That's why God has given us his word. 1,500 years, God had chosen over 40 different men to write down some things down, not just for themselves, but for us also. So guard your heart above all else, for it's the source of life. I'd like to talk about this morning sacred enclosures. Sacred enclosures. Cordero had, one, had, had, had given one particular illustration. In 1606, a place today known as California, uh, tiny seedlings poke through the surface and sprang up through the years. The young saplings uh, became what we know of today as a giant sequoia tree. Three years later, they were over 11 feet tall. That same year, an English translation called the King James Version of Scriptures was written. The trees had grown throughout American history and grew to over 250 feet tall. But something happened lately. One of the sequoias came crashing down to the ground. The mystery of it was that no storms had taken place. No fire, no flood, no windstorm, no indication of insect damage. The forestry, the forestry experts were perplexed. What mysterious force had taken down the behemoth that had lived so long? Finally, they had found out what had happened. It was foot traffic. Foot traffic. A national newscaster explained that foot traffic around the base of the tree over the years had damaged the root system. He added that the park officials instituted a policy of fencing in some of the oldest and largest and most historically significant trees. Why? To keep the public from trampling the root systems of the giants. The point? Even the biggest. Even the strongest of the sequoias who had lived hundreds of years could not survive when there was no protection from their root system. What is true of the sequoias is true for you and for me. Unless we find a way to protect our root system and nourish our roots in the Lord. No matter how big, no matter how strong, no matter how great you are in faith, we too will fall. Sacred enclosures. The trees need an enclosure around them in order that the world does not trample on their roots. We as believers, if we do not have the sacred enclosure around us, no matter how big, no matter how strong, no matter how self-sufficient we are, we will come tumbling down. 
like the sequoia trees who have been around for 400 years, that came down. You know, one particular thing, I was in my devotionals this past week. What was amazing is God began to speak to me. Uh, he tells Moses his intention in general. That the children of Israel should build him a sanctuary for he designed to dwell among them. In Exodus, Moses used to take a tent and he pitched it outside the camp. And amazing thing, it was away from the people. Some distance away, and he called it the tent of meeting. And anyone requiring of the Lord would go to the tent of the meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances of their tents, watching Moses until he entered that tent. And as Moses went into the tent, they all stood and worshiped. And then the Lord would speak to Moses as one would speak to a friend. This is a place God would meet Moses face to face when he went in the pillar of the cloud would, would come over the tent. The phrase tent of meeting is used in the tent of the Old Testament, specifically in Exodus, Leviticus, num and in Numbers, as a place where God would meet with his people, Israel. Having this meeting place was so important that God has Moses later in chapter 25 build another place of meeting. This time it's going to be God's temple, his tabernacle, sometimes called the tent of the congregation. So all along, God is and always has been interested in communicating with his people. And just before this, God had Moses go up to the Mount Sinai. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered for six days. And on the seventh, the Lord called Moses from the cloud. The appearance of the Lord's glory to the Israelites was a consuming fire, and Moses entered the cloud 40 days and 40 nights. Why? To give him instruction again. To communicate with him again. Did you know Christianity, of course Judaism, before Christianity, is the only religion that claims to have a relationship with God? That God is actually interested in having a relationship with his people. Did you know that? He says, Moses, tell the Israelites to, to make an offering for me. They are to make a sanctuary for me, and you must make it the way I tell you. Build an ark. Make it out of acacia wood. Overlay it with pure gold. Make a mercy seat. He gives instructions. Make two cherubims of gold. Set the mercy seat on top of the ark. Put the tables of testimony that I give you into the ark, and I will meet you there. And I will speak with you there. The table, the lampstands, and the tabernacle itself, the altar of burnt offering, the priestly garments, the ephod, the breastplate, the robe, the incense, the altar, the bronze basin, the anointing oil, the sacred incense. How big of a deal do you think it is to God? <laughs> to go through that much. To have go, Moses go through that much to make a place to be able to speak with God. How big of a deal do you think it actually it is? That looks like a pretty big deal to me. If God were that intricate and had that many things to do, or, or, or told Moses to do, how important do you think it might be? Do you think it might be important to make a sacred enclosure? Look what Hebrews 9.24 says. 
The gospel church is the true tabernacle now, which the Lord had pitched as a tent. But not man. Look what Hebrews 8.2 says, the body of Christ in which in which he made atonement was the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Do you think God changed his mind on communicating with his people? He did not. He did not. God is still in the communication business with his people. To those that are surrendered to him, to those that are submitted to him, to those who pray, to those who fast, to those who seek his face, to those who look for his voice. God's in the same business he was yesterday, today, and forevermore. You know, what was so amazing about what God did with Moses? Yeah, the miracles were great. But it, the most amazing thing is, because I can understand it now, is was his intimacy with God. I've had some pretty incredible intimate moments with God as actually speaking to me, and I can fully understand the intimacy that he had with God and the intimacy he wants with us. Still, he is interested in you. He is interested in me. He created you. You're born again now, I hope. God has began something inside of you. And if you're not, come see me after. Or see somebody here. <laughs> that he started this new thing, this new seed inside of you. Do you think he's just going to leave it there? Oh, I'm all done with you now. I no longer want to speak to you now. No. No. You know, I think it's important to recognize that he had his tent erected outside the camp. It wasn't in the hustle and the bustle of everyday life. And yes, we need to walk with God through that. But it was a time he, he took and he got away from it all. To draw near to him in intimacy, we will all need a quiet places where we can withdraw and spend uninterrupted time alone with our Lord. It's imperative. Our root system. That sacred enclosure. It's not an option for us, people, church. We're not our own person anymore. We have a God that we need to submit to daily. Always humble ourselves. Pray. Seek his face. That's why he said continuously. I'm wondering who might be feeling tired or weary or struggling. Or maybe you just have allowed so much foot traffic inside of your life. You know, Cordero says this, if we protect the most important part of us, our soul will link us with our creator. You cannot afford to neglect this. You know, if you develop a habit, habit seeing that God has made it such a high priority, and who would know better? Who would know better about that, those foundations of human life better than the builder himself. Could you turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 10? Verses 38. I think we're all pretty familiar with the story. It 
Luke chapter 10, verses 38. While they were traveling, he entered a village, meaning Jesus, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha. Martha. Now you said it twice. <laughs> you recognize that. <laughs> He's really trying to get a, a point across to her. When someone's really trying to speak to you, and they care about you, that's what I'm reading there, that's for sure. They really, really are earnestly care about you. I, I, I hear you. I know what you're saying. You are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. You know, other versions say one thing is essential. The word essential, necessary, have to, must. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. You know, Jesus says only a few things are really essential in life. Really only one. Mary has chosen the good one, the good part, which shall never be taken from her. Only one thing is essential. Why did he say that? her decision to sit at Jesus' feet above everything else on this planet was the right one. You know, God can be too easily forgotten in the madness of all of our lives, the busyness, even especially in church. I know many pastors have been taken down not that they didn't necessarily love God, but they got so busy, or even in the body of Christ, get so busy doing things that we neglected the most important thing. That's the one thing that I learned from that book. The most important, the most essential thing is to spend that time. Protect your root system. Hear the builder's voice inside of your ears and your heart. That you know that you know that you just spent some time with a master. Well, can you say who has time for spiritual things in my two very important tasks I had to do? After all, I'm busy caring for people. Like Martha said. Or maybe our deepest heart is we care, but we just do not know what to do about it. I want to petition to you to carve out carve out some time for what Jesus calls the most essential. The, the most necessary thing to do in our lives is to sit at our master's feet. Because if we don't do that, our root system will be trampled on, will be stepped on, will be discouraged, will be in that desert Many of us might say, well, poor, that poor soul, Martha. Nobody's helping. 
You know what Psalms 46, 10 says? Be still and know that I am God. You know, imagine it this way. I saw a commentary. God was inviting, uh, inviting us to an elegant banquet. You see a magnificent table overflowing with food. Everything you need is at the table. Comfort. Wisdom. Peace. Love. Joy. Patience. How about this one? Worth. Worth is a big one. Joy, victory, forgiveness, truth. The list goes on. God's heart is he would want you to walk away satisfied from his table. What parent, when he feeds his kids or their kids, would, walk away, would want them to walk away hungry? None of us. None of us. Psalms 107.9 says, He satisfied the thirsty and fills the hungry. Hebrews 13.21 says, He is equipping us with everything good that you may do His Will. Essential. You know, I, I was in a store the other day, and, and uh, of course you hear a lot about essential workers, and um, I saw one of the distributors, uh, a fellow distributor out there, and he had a big emblem on the back of his shirt. Essential worker. Why are they an essential Worker? Well, they're considered essential is because people need food. They need to eat. So the government has labeled them as, or us, I should say, as essential, part of essential workers. Meaning, we can't go without it or we're going to die. If you don't eat, you die. Right? So that's why they're called essential and Jesus is using that same word necessary or essential. The necessary thing. The most important. He labeled it that important. Can you imagine that? And we know that Jesus revealed to us in and through his life. He wasn't just, just tell us. But of course he did it. On a daily basis, we know he communicated with his father. We know he humbled himself before his father. We know people like Moses was not above it. But went to that tent of meeting. That he get that information, that communication from God. In order for him to communicate it to the Israelites. He wasn't above it. Nobody is above it. That's why Jesus says, when Mary was sitting at his feet, she picked the right thing to do. Where is it on our priority list is the big question. The $100,000 question. As Christians as we walk through life, where is it on our priorities? Where are we? Honestly, you don't need to tell me. You don't need to raise your hand. You know, it's easy, but you need, we need to honestly ask ourselves, where is it on our priority list that we are sitting at the master's feet, getting direction, getting communication? That friendship, as God speaks to our hearts. I'm not telling you he's going to pull you out of your troubles. In this world, we're going to have many troubles. 
But what he brings to the table for us is strength. To over, we're overcomers of the world, he said. No longer should we let those things bother us anymore. Why? Because we know we have our master with us. That's why the disciples could go all the way to the cross themselves. They knew the master was with them. He spent time with them. They were sold out with their lives. God may not be calling you to a cross, but he's calling you to carry your cross wherever he is taking you. And you can't get that, that information until we're what? Submitted to him. We can't get to that place where all engines are running inside of our life until God gets us there and finally breaks us to that point. Because we're like wild stallions, aren't we? We want to be our own person. I got this, God. Really? <laughs> and Martha's all irritated, I guarantee you. As Mary's sitting there at the feet, it's like, man, what's your problem? I guarantee you, she has clanging them dishes, <laughs> chopping that food. <laughs> you know how we get angry when no one's helping around the house? <laughs> Martha, calm down. <laughs> Not that I don't love a good worker, because I do. But it's the proper time and place. Of course, the Lord loves a hard worker. He wasn't putting Martha down for working hard. But he was trying to teach the necessity of what it means. That sacred enclosure and the importance of it. That's why God had did it all the way back with Moses. He set it up. Now that, that that curtain is ripped open, now the church, you, the tabernacle, is now in you. Did you not know that? Within you, where God resides inside of you. Made not by human hands, but by God, who has perfected it with his Church, Moses yearned for God, for, to, for the Israelites to have what he had. They didn't have what you have. We're actually really fortunate to be living in the church age, that we have access to God like that. He has poured out his spirit now into his body, into his church. And we're to carry that message. That's our responsibility now, to carry that message into a world that's dying. That's why we're out here. I got lots of other things to do on Saturdays and give out food. But that's why we do it. It's a higher calling. It's a higher purpose. We're not doing it for the money. And we're not doing it for the fame. We do it for our Lord. Everything we do for him. If it's one person that we can change the mind of, one person, don't you think it would have been worth it? To hear his voice, to follow through what he's asking. I tell you, I get up in the morning, I just can't stand it. I got, I say, I gotta go hear what God's got to say. As you begin to just tune into that voice and pick up on that voice, what God is trying to, to say to us, it's exciting. It's exciting to hear his voice, to be part of something so spectacular as God. <laughs> it don't get any better we're employed, who we're employed by. Come on, church. You know, sometimes we're not always sure. Moses had uh, spoke to God. You know, you've been telling me to lead pe these people, but you have not let me know where you're sending me or who's going to help me. 
You know, one particular thing that God knows our hearts. And you might not have the total vision, the, the total thing that he's asking. But he's going to begin to get you on the right track. He's going to equip you with just what you need. You don't need somebody else's talent. You don't need somebody else's gift. You have everything you need equipped by God to do what he's asking you to do. And he knows your heart. So we can't hide from God. And Moses wasn't always sure either. So he, he was asking, and he's asking, and he's asking. And of course, God began to give him that, that picture. But he was asking. That's the point I want to make. He was actually asking. Lord, how do you want me to do that? How do you want me to serve that person? How do you want me to serve you? He was asking. I had to come to a point in my life where I had, you know, I felt ill-equipped. Not talented to a job where I never even, even crossed my mind. So I, I, I want to put this out to you. Be wary, be careful of what, if you think you got it all. Because you have, probably have a lot more in you, that you than you know about right now. He's looking for you to be asking. Asking. What is it then, Lord, you want me to say? Ha, I looked at myself as nothing more than an evangelist, and that was it. Do you want me to, I'm not a pastor. I tell the Lord, I'm not a pastor, Lord. I'm an evangelist. I like what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm comfortable what I'm doing. Watch that word comfortable because God kind of wakes you up on that one and begins to stretch you out when you ask him, okay, I want you to do this. It might not be what you had in mind. But we, we serve an awesome God, and he gets you to that place where, what? You're not relying on yourself anymore. 